This is a prayer that you are singing, and it comes from Scripture. We're going to be talking about how it's uh, wonderful to spend time. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And so I encourage you to take that song to heart. Sh uh, shake off the cares of the world for this time in worship today. <laughs> all to uh, Road to Emmaus Presbyterian Church, where together we have a heart for the Harrisburg area, and we are making new and growing disciples of Jesus Christ. 
Um, if you are visiting with us today or if you have a prayer request, there are um, cards in the seat packs in front of you. Please fill one of those out and, and share it with us. Um, we'd like to get to know you better, and we'd also like to know any prayers or prayers, praises or concerns that you have. And to those that are worshiping with us online, we are welcoming you as well. And uh, please feel free to call or email the church office if you have any prayer requests. So um, <clears throat> wasn't wasn't supposed to be on the lay reader schedule today. We had a lot of shifting around, but I was lucky enough, um, I think, to get um, to be able to lay read on on the July 4th holiday on on Independence Day. And today I was like, I thought, you know what, I think I want to take a look at the Declaration of Independence. Honestly, we don't look at it very often. I think we should. It's not very long. If you've ever been to the archives down in D.C., you'll notice it's only about four pages. Um, but I thought, I thought about those that wrote those words that day and what they wanted to do. And it was pretty gutsy because I think on paper we should have lost. Um, you know, we were going up against the most powerful country in the world. But um, the first opening words, which we are all really familiar with, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they're endowed, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable, unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So very early on in that document, we recognize that we get things from our creator. We are not here on our own. But the last part of the Declaration of Independence, I just want to read to you, because there are many times in that document that the Founding Fathers invoked our, our Lord. Um, but at the very end, it said, and for the support of this declaration, and with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. We only won because we put our reliance and our faith in God. And so today, I think with much of the division that we have in the country, if we go back to those words and we pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, and bring him back into our lives and into our country, I think... I think we'll move forward in a positive direction. So. Please join me in the call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Our opening hymn this morning is Give Praise to the Lord. The words are on, on, on um, hymn number 257 in the blue hymnal, but we will be singing it to the, to the uh, melody of the hymn number 476. We'd ask you to please stand. And you'll see the words on the screen, so uh, unless you're a music reader, don't sweat it.
translation about the words at the end, so I apologize. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of glory and honor, we cannot escape from our guilt and come to be made clean in your mercy. We easily excuse our poor behavior, comparing ourselves favorably with those we label worthless or hypocrites. The very judgment breaks faith with you. Even as we avoid the worst of sin, pride and self-centeredness rule our days. We are not violent, but we have not yet adopted the way of peace and mercy. We need your welcoming love and humbly seek your forgiveness. Amen. The glory of God is revealed anew to us in the birth of each new day. We are reborn when we pause to marvel at the gift of life, when we look beyond ourselves to gaze at the stars. Before the vast mystery of time and space, we are amazed that God cares for us, forgives us, and entrusts to us the stewardship of the earth and our lives. God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Amen. We're going to respond to what God has done for us, what only he could do for us, with the words to Refiner's Fire. If it's not familiar with you, uh, to you, it, um, feel free to learn it the first time through. There's a couple of verses. If it is familiar, please sing it with your heart. Purify. Purify my heart. Let me...
more time, refiners. It is Psalm 8. It may be found on page 450 of the Pew Bible, or the words will be on the screen. Hear the word of the Lord. Our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands, and you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As the kids are coming in for the children's message, let's take some time to greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Please uh, shake a hand. The Lord be with you. Should be have the green light. <laughs> Hi, Jaden and Adrian and Waylon and Zach. No, Jeremy. Zach, Zach, I was right the first time. I don't know why I haven't met a lot for that. So, well, I'm glad you're all here. I'm wearing red, white, and blue today. And if you notice, a lot of people are wearing red, white, and blue. And that's because of the special day. Does anybody know what today is? Yes, sir. July 4th. Yeah, and what's so important about July 4th? Celebrating the country. That's right, the birth of our country, which was only here because of the grace of God. So anyhow, I'm gonna have you help lead us in worship today. Mrs. Lowe is gonna hand everybody a wand here for and we're going to read part of a song that all your parents are familiar with by Lee Greenwood called God Bless the USA. And there's one part 
in the verse what I'm going to say, and I'll gladly stand with you today. And I want you to stand up. And when you stand up, then everyone in the congregation is going to stand up and follow you. Okay. okay? So get ready to stand up. Okay. I'm proud to be American. Well, at least I know I'm free. And I won't forget the men who died to, to give me the right to be free. And I'll gladly stand up next to you. Stand up. Everybody stand up. And you can wave your wands. Yeah. Wave it up in the air. Yeah, up in there. Because there ain't no doubt I love this land. God bless the USA. Great. Yay. Okay. You, you can keep those. I have something else now for Mrs. Love to hand up. Yep. Yep. Put them on them. Here. This is a flag. You don't see a lot of it anymore today. Has it, Zachary, do you know what it is? That's right. It's a Christian flag. And it's red, white, and blue, too, for, but for different reasons. The white part stands for Jesus, who was free of sin, but brought peace to us through his obedience. And then the blue part is for the truth and for the baptism into our Lord. And, of course, the red part is because he died on the cross and shed his blood for us. Now, in the Bible... The Apostle Paul tells Timothy that we should not be afraid or ashamed to be a Christian, and we should go out and tell other people about our wonderful Lord. So I have another poem to read from Diana Wells that's called I'm Proud to Be a Christian. It sounds very similar to the first poem. That's why I have a cheat sheet here today. <laughs> and... When we get to the part about I'll gladly stand up with you, then you can stand up and everybody in the congregation is going to stand up, okay? And yeah, you can wave a Christian flag this time. I'm glad to be a Christian because in him I'm free and I won't forget the Christ who died on Calvary. So I'll gladly stand up next to you today and praise his name today. Because there ain't no doubt I love our Lord who took my sins away. Amen, everybody. Yay. <laughs> yeah. You did a great job helping us, leading us in worship. So let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the Independence Day. But we thank you. We're only here because of your blessing. And help us to once again return to a country, one nation, under God. And we also thank you for your son, that he died so we may all have the ultimate freedom and go to you in heaven. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. You guys can keep those. those are yeah, you can keep those things. That should be better. All right. Excellent. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our time together today. Uh, just ask, Lord, that you would indeed uh, bless us uh, as a nation, uh, but not because we are simply Americans, but because we are children of God who endeavor to be um, individuals, uh, churches, neighborhoods, communities, and a country that honors and serves you. We know that that is our true and only strength uh, in this world. And so we humbly come before you today uh, as a nation. Uh, may you, our gold, refine this day. And we pray it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. Very good. A welcome to our next installment of this sermon series uh, called Summer Wisdom. Let's see if I can get my slides uh, right. Oh, we're going to be here at the uh, first second reading of the Bible here at verse three of Ephesians. I almost forgot. I'm glad the slides are there. <laughs> uh, hear now the word of the Lord from the New Testament, uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians here at chapter three, uh, first, uh, chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless 
before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the promise of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, now here's the slide I was looking for. We are in this next installment of our summer series called Summer Wisdom. And during the summer, we, uh, we all recognize that there is this different pace of life. Things sometimes get just a little slower. Uh, our brains and bodies do need a rest that we uh, often seek in the summertime. <clears throat> a little rest and relaxation for our souls. And vacations are good for this. Time off in the summer is good for us. They are, in fact, uh, a godly thing. There's no, uh, I think there's no mistaking recreation, recreation as something that the Lord calls us to, uh, a Sabbathness to summer. And we should recognize that God gives this time to us. Uh, and we should also recognize that God does not call us to a vacation away from him, but rather this rest and recreation in him. And this is exactly what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 11, when he says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so in this summertime uh, sermon series, uh, I don't want to put a lot on your plates. Uh, I don't want to put another thing on your weekly calendar, nothing that you have to schedule. Uh, and in fact, what I'd really like to do is, is find a way in our sermon times to provide rest for your souls. And, and it seemed to me that talking about wisdom uh, while being so important is not really a nuts and bolts application Thing that I'm asking you to do right now. I'd like you to rest in these things. I'd like you to, to drink them in deeply. Uh, it's, these are very important things, of course, and they will uh, result in things that we are called to do in our daily lives. But on these summer Sundays, let's rest in God's word and seek his wisdom, drink it in deeply. Now, so God does teach us wisdom in a variety of ways, uh, but most importantly, he teaches us wisdom through his word. And there is this big block of Old Testament literature that is called the books of wisdom. This is the wisdom literature, and they include things like Job and Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, and the Song of Solomon. Uh, and this is uh, a... a uh, recognized as wisdom literature because in it is modeled and in it is taught the, the various ways that uh, we can gain intelligence for living, wisdom for living, knowledge for living. Uh, it, it speaks to um, our emotional lives and our spiritual lives, our souls and our minds. There's a depth to it that we can uh, rest in. It teaches us how to operate these lives successfully. It teaches us how to live uh, given the ups and the downs. It is always disciplined. It's always thoughtful. It's always long-term. And it's always a sustainable arrangement for living. This is what wisdom is all about. And wisdom, of course, is found in the Bible. So last week we took a look at the book of Job. Uh, it's a big book um, and we took a look at the whole thing. It's a big chunk. I know that was a fast and low kind of uh, flyby of the book of Job, but there's a lot there uh, that is important for us. The biggest thing, of course, that we saw there is that suffering is an inevitable part of the human experience. And given this well, unrelenting reality in our lives, 
it, 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 it teaches us the ways to cope with this thing, this suffering that we can't avoid. Uh, now, one way that people often do it is to, well, as Mrs. Job said, curse God and die. This was Job's wife's, uh, you know, advice to him. Just curse God and die. Just, just. <clears throat> and this is, as it turns out, according to the book of Job, exactly what Satan wants. This is what he wants us to do. He wants us to turn away to, from God to in our disappointment from uh, from what we expected God to be and do in the world to just turn away from it, him and to live on our own. Satan's purpose for us is, in fact, to die apart from God and to consume our souls. This is what he intends. He's Satan. Now, while God is not the cause of suffering in our lives, God does indeed have a different purpose for suffering in our lives. This is one of the big lessons from last week, that from the book of Job, we saw that walking with God through our suffering will grow us in faith. And this is uh, sort of one of the end, end of the book lessons from Job chapter 42. Job finally comes to the point where he says to the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted, can be interrupted. He had been saying, who is this that hides knowledge? Or God said this, who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Quoting God, then Job says, therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. And so Job comes to faith through his suffering. He is strengthened in his suffering. There is a resilience that comes as we live through our suffering, walking with the Lord. And this is what James chapter 1 speaks to us, teaches to us. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and steadfastness has its full effect, that you may be complete and perfect, lacking in nothing. This is God's purpose for our suffering. So today we're going to take this next step in summer wisdom, and we're going to begin uh, a, a couple of messages, five of them to be exact, in the book of Psalms. And so we start there today with the wisdom of the Psalms and with the wisdom of the Psalms of praise. Now, the book of Psalms, as many of you know, is a rather large chunk of the Old Testament. There's 150 chapters there, the largest Bible, the longest Bible book in the Bible. And the Hebrew word for that, uh, for the, the English version of our Bibles, Psalms, actually is uh, the word from Greek that talks about the book of praises. The book of praises. That's a the, the psalm, uh, the, the English word psalm comes from the Greek word used in the New Testament for the book of Psalms. I know that's a very convoluted uh, line, but uh, you get where I'm going. Uh, and this is where we get the word uh, psalter from as well. If you've been, heard anyone talk about the psalter, that's kind of the Greek um, rooting of our English word. Now, the authors of this collection of 150 poems and songs is varied. 73 of them, though, are traditionally attributed to King David. He was a songwriter, warrior king. Kind of an interesting conglomeration of things in one person. There are a few psalms that are attributed to a uh, priest slash musician from the time of David by the name of Asaph. Others are the Psalms of the Sons of Korah, and the Sons of Korah are a family of Levite priests who were known for providing music in the temple. And then there's a couple of Psalms sprinkled through that are attributed to King Solomon and to Moses, and some of them are just simply anonymous. Uh, they were uh, sort of all at least edited and brought together by the end of the 4th century B.C., and the subject matter that you find in the Psalms is one of the things that actually makes it quite an interesting book because there's so much variety. There are Psalms of lament. There are Psalms of festival. There are Psalms of praise and thanksgiving. Psalms of deliverance. Psalms uh, written for royalty. And uh, a whole slew of other things as well. And, and I've heard it said, and I rightly believe this, that the book of Psalms contains the full range of, of human emotions. You hear people crying out to God in anger 
and 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 sorrow as well as the highest praise that the word of God can offer. There is joy and sadness, pleasure and pain, victory and loss, confession and repentance. And today we think about one of the many psalms of praise, and that's where we come to Psalm 8. Now you uh, may be familiar with this guy, Carl Sagan. He apparently has his own day. You're familiar with him. He's uh, sort of that famous astrophysicist from the uh, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, and he was, I think, more widely known as what is commonly called a, a science communicator. And uh, took to writing books. And uh, he's actually wrote the screenplay for the movie Contact. I don't know if you saw that one with Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. Uh, and uh, hosted a bunch of TV programs. And he was known for asking sort of in a public way, uh, you know, who are we and where are we? Are we alone in the universe? And he was famous, uh, famously known for, I think, personally funding and in part participating in the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. <clears throat> now, the answer that he offered to these big questions that he asked of the world uh, was that, as you see it here, uh, that we are made of star stuff. Now, he rather hoped, I think, to offer this explanation in a rather poetic way to try to, to give it some weight. You know, that you are made of stardust. Doesn't that sound romantic? Well, somehow uh, it, it was an intent, I think, on his part to help people feel some value because they, they perhaps somehow glimmer and shine like stars. Uh, that, that we somehow are made of the same material as the universe itself. But another way to look at that is just to simply say we are indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the background stuff of the universe, that we sort of blend right in and are kind of invisible. To say we're made of the same stuff as stars is, the, is also to say we're made of the same stuff as the dirt you walk on. It's the same stuff. In a strictly material sense, we are indeed indistinguishable from the rest of the universe. Now, getting to Psalm 8, again attributed to King David, this question is asked in verse 4. What is man? But this question is asked with a certain uh, uh, certainty that comes along with it. What is man that you are mindful, you God, are mindful of him. Now, this question immediately draws us to the value that we have because God has us in mind. And in fact, that is as a species and as individuals, it is the only way that we can know value as human beings because otherwise we're just walking dirt. That's what we are. We're just the stuff of the universe, indistinguishable from the background. But we hear King David say that because we are made in God's image and by God's design, that God, being mindful for us of us, gives us this immense value. Now, recognizing that God has assigned us this value for no other reason than he loves us as his children. Why does he love us? Because he loves us. We can know that we are not just some speck of sand on the cosmic beach, that we're not just some little blip on the ever-increasing timeline, that we are given a time and place to live and move and have our being here and now because God designs it. God intends us. God has us in his mind. And so the psalmist begins this particular psalm with praise. He says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Now, just a couple little things to point out about even these first few words. That when King David here says, O oh Lord, he is invoking the name Yahweh. He is speaking of the one who was and is and is to come. He is the great I am. He is the one who is before all things and makes all things to be. And all things to um, have value and, and purpose. He has a personal name. Yahweh. We are called to call on him in a personal 
way. I've heard it said uh, of the commandment, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Most of us tend to assume that means don't say the Lord's name in unflattering ways, like when you stub your toe in the middle of the night. But I think more importantly, there's a way to think about that differently. That is to have his name, but to never call on it. If you had the phone number of someone that you um, knew and respected, that you valued, but never called that number, you had it in vain. We have the name of the Lord, the one who it was and is and is to come, the one who loves you and shows you mercy. Don't have that name in vain. And then it says, our Lord. And so this is the one to whom we belong. Our Lord. We belong to him. How excellent is his name. How broad, how vast, how majestic, how powerful. And he is unsurpassed in his presence. Even children confirm his strength. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established or ordained. That's another word that show up, shows up in our English translations. That these children have ordained strength because of your foes. What does it mean to ordain? Well, when you ordain me as your pastor and you ordain elders and deacons, you, um, you recognize that God has a call on their lives and you affirm that call. Even children affirm the power and strength of the Lord. Young and old, of all stripes in this world. And then even enemies, Satan himself, are silent in comparison. You still the enemy and the avenger. And so when God's people, weak and strong alike, begin to praise his name as King David leads us in Psalm 8, the realm of Satan and his demons is rolled back. That's good news for us. And then the psalmist turns his attention to the glory of God's creation. The heavens are the work of his fingers. Just think about that for a moment. The work of fingers is dainty, light work. That's all it takes for the power of God to make the universe the work of his fingers. And then here is the great question. What is man that you are mindful of him? They are, um, they are made to be cared for by the Lord of the universe. They are made for a time on earth, a little lower than the heavenly beings. These are the angels. Uh, we are not angels. We don't become angels, as a matter of fact, when we pass from this earth to enter into eternal life. We are always his children, different than his angels. But the, the angels are relegated to God's work. We are made in um, the way that people tend to visualize heaven as being above. We are made a little lower than the angels, but we are crowned with glory and honor differently than the angels in that we are the children of God. We are his sons and daughters. We are given a more privileged place in the heart of God than the angels, even than the angels. And we are given dominion over the earth. Of course, to till it and keep it according to the beginning of Genesis. But all things are put under our feet. All the, the beasts of the field, every element of the creation is given to us to till and keep, to have dominion over and then, of course, the psalmist again echoes the great truth. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, we've included this idea of psalms of praise in this series called Summer Wisdom. So how is it that the, our praise for God, of God, to God, is part of wise living? Let me see if I can point out a few things here for you. First of all, we see this promise in Ephesians that um, we uh, bless God. Blessed be God. This is an act of praise when we bless the name of the Lord. Blessed be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so the, it's rather natural for us to say thank you to God. Bless you God for blessing me. And so, you know, that might be fairly obvious. Uh, back here at uh, verse 12, we skipped a few things. Um, we were the first to hope in Christ. He's speaking, of course, to the first generations of Christians. We who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And so followers of Jesus themselves 
are to the praise of his glory. Our very lives are an act of praise to him. The way we live them. Every fiber of our being. And so Paul gives us a great set of reasons to motivate our praise and uh, to echo the words of the Psalms. And so let's see if we can get just a little more specific and a little deeper. And I'd like you to listen to the words of someone I highly admire. Check this out. Oh, we're going to need to get the volume up on ProPresenter. Oh, hold on. Yep. There you go. And now if you'd hit clear all. There we go. We're good. Oh, it's a beautiful night in this neighborhood. <laughs> So many people have helped me to come to this night. Some of you are here, some are far away, some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take, along with me, 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are? those who have cared about you and wanted what was best for you in life. Ten seconds of silence. I'll watch the time. <laughs> Whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you feel they've made. So at the 1997 Emmy Awards, hosted by a very young Tim Robbins, uh, it, while not mentioning God, Mr. Rogers engages in the basic realities of praise. Now, he's, of course, asking us to be thankful for the people in our lives who have helped us to come to be who we are. Uh, but we have to also acknowledge that um, that he believes, being uh, actually an ordained Presbyterian minister, as it turns out, uh, that God is the one who most specifically loves us into being, as well as his people in our lives. That God is the one who made us who we are, that God most cares for us, that God is the one who most wants the best in our lives. And so to him be praise, right? To him be praise. So here are five things uh, that, uh, that help us to understand how praise brings wisdom to our lives, the praise of God. The first is to acknowledge that there is a God and it's not me. It's not you, right? There is a God and it is not me. And so praise brings us to a place of humility. Uh, and the, uh, we're going to look at James again here for just a second. James chapter 4 says, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And then here's this great um, call to humility. That we are not all of that. We're not uh, you know, uh, the most important person in every room. So cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Not that we are, we are to purposefully make ourselves sad for no reason before God, but to recognize the, uh, a humility in our lives, that we are not the smartest person in every room. We are not the most beautiful people that, uh, that everyone else knows. Okay, we are the children of God, and that's the only thing that makes us important. Therefore, I give my trust and honor and love to the one who makes me and gives me value and purpose. And so there's this humility that praise brings to our lives. Additionally, praise refocuses uh, my attention from self onto God. Uh, now, this gets at the foundational reality of what sin is. We tend to think about sin in terms of specific behaviors like kicking the dog or lying to your mama or, you know, these kinds of things. Those are sins, certainly, 
But the foundational reality of sin is a profound self-centeredness that does whatever it takes to get what I want when I want it. And so even as we engage in church, this profound self-centeredness can rear its ugly head. Even as we engage in prayer and sing our songs together and, and come together in fellowship, the people of God are prone to do so for the wrong reasons. Uh, and so the basic posture of praise shifts our reason from being here. Our reason for being here is not, Lord, bless me, uh, pastor, feed me, uh, give me what I want. It is, I will bless the Lord for who he is, right? Okay. So praise refocuses my attention from self to the one who is God. Praise also makes the enemy flee. Uh, there's a guy in the Old Testament named Jehoshaphat. What a great name. Going to name a dog that someday. Uh, and, and we see God miraculously defeat his enemies because the men under Jeho Jeho Jehoshaphat's uh, leadership praise God. Here's a little verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It says, as they, Jehoshaphat's men, began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the enemies, the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, the land of the Jewish people. And these enemies were defeated. And so prayer and praise became their basic tools to combat the enemy. And so as we praise, it pushes back the darkness that tends to surround us. It, it blocks the attacks and, and the, those hissing lies that are spoken to us by evil. And so praise makes the enemy to flee. And you can remember these words here from James chapter 4. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee to you from you rather draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So it makes the enemy flee and praise also leaves no room for complaining or negativity. You know, sometimes even within our prayer, our long prayer lists become a to do list for God to address the problems in our lives. Is that how your prayer list tends to go? Sometimes it's mine. Uh, but God knows our hearts and he cares already with his sovereign will for all of those things. He knows them already. And so it is helpful to add praise specific to our prayer. It might, you might even put that at the first thing to do in prayer. That we would adore God. That we would bless his name. That we would praise him in our prayer before we get to anything that we want from him to anything that might be called supplication. Be reminded of what he has already done in your life. He has shown you all mercy, every mercy that you need. He's given you everything that you need already. And so finally, praise is uh, given to the community of faith uh, because it is a holy and unifying thing. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that make us similar in this room today. There, you might point to things like education or culture uh, or age range or whatever it might be. But we could find 10 times as many things that make us different in terms of, of skin tone or, or hair or height uh, or whatever it might be. There are, are always things that humans will be drawn to that make them different. But there's only one blessed tie that binds us together. It is that we are beloved of God. And for him, we, to him, we give praise for that. The community that worships together, that gives praise together, that focuses together on the one Lord, finds an ultimate point of unity that cannot be found in any other way amid the myriad differences among its people. And so our praise and worship provides for us an opportunity to confess and profess our faith before others. I'd like you to say with me these words. The Psalms of praise give words to act, uh, to, for us to act on that helps us and enables wisdom in our lives. And so say these words with me. Blessed, O Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Thanks be to God for this.
We're going to come now to uh, the Lord's Supper, and uh, my apologies to the folks that are running the slides. I don't have my liturgy with me, and so we're going to do this in a much more informal way today. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the possibility of coming to this table. It is enabled by your grace and mercy alone that we would be so intimately connected with you that you would allow us to receive your presence into our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit through this activity that we call communion. And so, Lord, bless this time that we have together. And as we uh, listen to this uh, special piece of uh, music today, as we sing together, as we come to the table, may your mercy be shown to us now. And so let's uh, first sing our song, Come to the Table of Mercy. <coughs> Come to the table. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's table. Friends, on the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his friends together, his disciples. And taking the loaf of bread and breaking it, he gave thanks and then gave it to his friends. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took a cup and he poured the wine out into that cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, a covenant that is sealed in my blood, blood that is shed for you for the forgiveness of of your sins. Each time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again in glory. Thanks be to God. Let's, uh, let's come to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us in this time and place, <clears throat> for being our Father, uh, and for being worthy of our praise in every way. And so we do give you praise and honor today as the people of God. And we ask, Lord, today that we might um, find ourselves uh, more often and more naturally in your presence, giving you thanks and praise, and that that would add wisdom to our lives. Today we ask, Lord, uh, for a uh, each other on behalf of each other for these very special requests. We pray for uh, William, who's struggling with pneumonia, for a, a little girl uh, just 10 years old in New Jersey who's had heart surgery. Be with her for healing. Uh, we ask, Lord, today that you would be with Mike Klinger, a friend of Michael Singley's, who's had a car wreck and uh, had surgery. And we just ask, Lord, that his healing would be swift and complete. We pray for a friend, Jean, who's had a terrific fall, just an awful accident, and is uh, facing a long, long uh, period of recovery. We ask, Lord, that you would give he and his family 
uh, uh, the, the, the energy and the fortitude to go down this long road of healing, we pray. Uh, thank you, Lord, for their faith. We pray, Lord, for our friend Shirley, um, who also had a fall and is now recovering uh, at, at the hospital. And we ask, Lord, that you might see a way clear for her to be able to return home as she so desires. We ask, Lord, that you'd be with Hannah today as uh, she uh, is preparing for the delivery of her baby. Be with uh, the, the Hakes family and, and Dad Sam uh, as they're getting ready for that, uh, that blessed day. We thank you, Lord, for marriage and for the Jurgens, for Peg and Bruce and their 45 years. I uh, just uh, bless them as they celebrate uh, that great gift in their lives and their, the great gift to this community. We pray for a man named Mark who faces so many things. Bless him now, uh, this very day. And as a uh, as a friend, Cindy's brother has uh, has requested special prayer for him. We just ask, Lord, that you would bless that uh, that desire, even in the midst of all of this, to come before you and to seek your will and way in the life of another. Thank you, Lord, for this great privilege. And together we pray as you have taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our last song today will be Blessed Assurance. It's number 341 in the hymnal. And of course, the words will be on the screen. great voices. Please be seated for just a moment. A uh, few uh, things to think about in terms of upcoming ministry. Let's see if we can all get there. We go. If you need a moment of prayer, uh, I'd be happy to meet with you for a little one-on-one -on -one prayer as always. So uh, just come on up. This Tuesday, we have our next Tuesday together. Bring your own dinner at 6 p.m. We'll provide some uh, goodies afterwards as a snack. Uh, and we've been playing Family Feud Guys Against the Girls 
the guys are losing bad. So, you know, guys, guys need some help. You need help. Yeah, come on out. So, uh, and then we're going to watch, uh, actually, we're going to review the last episode of The Chosen, uh, episode six of season two, I think. And we'll be discussing it a little bit more intently uh, this time uh, around. And then uh, we do have Saturday prayer uh, and a prayer walk at 9 a.m. And then uh, for uh, the month of July, all of those of you who are on ministry teams and who are deacons uh, past and elders, past and present, uh, and spouses, you're invited to the Lowe's home, my home, Becky's home, on July the 19th. Uh, there'll be an email for you to uh, participate in uh, bringing of some food and so on. Dinner, I spelled, misspelled dinner. It's not diner. 6 p.m. dinner and then our 7 o'clock meeting, and you'll see more in an email. Um, if, you, if, you want. if you want, if you're brave. <laughs> no, uh, so uh, please do come on out uh, for that. Are, are there other things to be announced? Uh, questions to ask? Yes, go ahead, Tina. I put this article in that table if you just take a minute. Thank you. Start. And if I'm missing people, if you think you need to be sent in person, please let, please let me know. Okay, thank you for taking Thanks. that on. All right, let's stand and please hold a hand. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise today for you are worthy of such. We ask, Lord, that our, our lives would be aligned uh, to the ways of praise and that it would bring wisdom to our lives in a way that we might have not previously thought of. Uh, so we come to you now humbly, giving you thanks, giving you our lives. And now as we leave from this time and this place, we ask, Lord, that you would use us according to your will and way to bring about glory and honor to your name, to help people see the, the beauty of the kingdom of God. And we pray this together in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. amen. Friends, go in peace.